Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 22, Bhutan. So for this episode's beverage of choice, I made some Bhutanese tea. Although, admittedly, I didn't have a yak on hand to get some yak milk, so I Americanized it a little bit. It's essentially a black tea mixed with milk, butter, yes, butter, and salt, and drank more like a soup broth and not really like a tea. It supposedly has a whole bunch of positive medical qualities like improving concentration, helping our digestive system, and keeping you warm, which wasn't really a goal of mine during the heat wave where it reached record temperatures in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure if I'd ever try it again, but it was still fun and easy to make. And finally, before I start talking about the country, I would like to thank Professor Dahitri Bhattachari from Western Washington University for helping me out with this episode. It was greatly appreciated. So Bhutan is located in South Asia, with its sandwich between China to the north and India to the south. It is located in the Himalayas, with almost all the country being mountainous and cold for most of the year. In the south, it does lower in elevation and is where the country gets the warmest. Much of the country is forested, and it actually is the only country with a negative carbon footprint due to how forested it is, and its forests are believed to capture up to 5 million tons of carbon every single year. Bhutan has around 750,000 people living in it, largely based in the center and south of the country. The country doesn't really have neat ethnic groups you can really classify people into, but you can broadly divide the country between the Westerners, known as the Nagalops, who are the dominant ethnic group in the country and are related to the Tibetan people in the north, the Sarchop, who are found in the east and often are kind of a combination of Tibetan people and other ethnic groups found in northeast India, the little Champas, who are found in the south and are often made up of people who migrated into the country from Nepal and to a lesser extent even India and Bangladesh, and finally many other smaller ethnic groups that are found throughout the country. There also has, since the mid 20th century, been a growing number of Tibetans and Indians moving into the country, either fleeing persecution or looking for work. Language-wise, it is again fairly divided. Most languages belong to the Sino-Tibetan language family, and are heavily related to other Tibetan languages. The official language of the country, Zonga, or as it is translated into English, language of the fortress, is often used in politics, education, mass media, and just everyday life. The largest non-Sino-Tibetan language is Nepali, which is an Indo-Aryan language and is related to other languages spoken in India, such as Guahari and Dorgi, and to a lesser extent even Hindi and tends to be spoken in the south. English is also commonly spoken among the elites in the country, or those who had just recently moved from India, and is especially prominent among those in high-ranking political positions. Religion-wise, the country is more unified when compared to ethnicity or language-wise. Buddhism is a state religion of the country, with around 75% of the country holding Buddhist beliefs, and are often heavily concentrated in the north and center of the country. Most Buddhists, including the royal family, practice a branch of Buddhism known as Vajrayana Buddhism, and tends to be closely related to Tibetan Buddhist practices. I am not a Buddhist, nor do I feel particularly comfortable going super in-depth with all the different Buddhist branches, but based generally on my understanding of Vajrayana Buddhism, it's a more esoteric version of Buddhism that places a heavy emphasis on letting you feel suffering, or discomfort in you, to kind of grow and favors the use of rich symbolism. Besides Buddhism, Hinduism is also present mostly in the south, with a little less than 25% of the country holding Hindu beliefs. Smaller groups of Protestant Christians, Muslims, and indigenous belief practitioners are also present in the country. Small tribal groups are believed to have entered Bhutan starting in 25,000 BCE, and according to legends, played a role in terrorizing those living in the low-lying plains, raiding settlements and taking slaves. Buddhism was said to have entered the region as early as the 7th century, helped by famous missionaries such as Padma Sabhava, I pray to God I pronounced that right. Generally, much of Bhutan's early history is kind of steeped in Buddhist legend and is often clouded and very vague. We do know two important things about this period, though. First off, much of Bhutan was divided between small localized rulers, known as Dung. These Dung would compete with each other, Buddhist religious leaders from various sects, and the indigenous religious groups and indigenous people over control over the limited farmland, trade routes, and people. The second thing is, we know Bhutan would have been heavily influenced by both Indian and Tibetan culture. Bhutan, while very mountainous and kind of inhospitable to move through, would see a small number of traders pass through it, influencing the culture as they went. 
Tibetan influence would dramatically increase in the 9th century with the collapse of the Tibetan Empire and later after the Mongols invaded Tibet in the 13th century. During both of these periods, large numbers of Tibetan refugees would have fled to Bhutan, often forming a key component in Western and Eastern Bhutanese society. Bhutan would eventually form into a society where much of the population was divided between the farmers and the monks, which is what even today Bhutanese society is often romanticized as solely consisting of. Agriculture, both during Bhutanese early history and up till today, is one of the main sectors of the economy. Rice is the main crop inside the country, but the apple, orange, wheat, and the potato market also are significant. Today, it is believed around 55% of the country relies on agriculture for a paycheck, including the vast majority of wage-earning women in the country. Also, briefly, I want to talk about the idea of reincarnation. Buddhists believe in the concept of rebirth, or when you die, you will be reborn as another person, or sometimes another living thing on the planet, unless you achieve nirvana. Among the many Buddhist sets in Tibet and Bhutan at the time, they often would believe that their leaders would become reincarnated after they died. So, after one of their leaders died, they would go out and look for their reincarnation, and then place them at the head of their movement. In the 1610s, arguably the most important figure in Bhutanese history arrived in the country, Zabdrung Namgwa Namgala. The Zabdrung was originally born in Tibet, and believed to be the reincarnation of the Drupka, or essentially the head of the Kaguru Drupka branch of Buddhism. He began facing troubles with the secular leaders in Tibet, and eventually, rising tension and a vision convinced him and his followers to move to Bhutan and build a base there. They were quite successful, convincing many of the local Dung to support them. These local lords would prove to be quite useful, helping the Zubdrung fight off around eight different Tibetan invasions of Bhutan. He was successful due to a combination of the rough terrain making it difficult for invading armies to come through and take over, some gunpowder weapons from Portuguese missionaries, and successful military commanders. It was also believed at the time that the Zubdrung had magical powers on his side. It is said he once meditated and gave one of his Tibetan rival smallpox, killing him. And a common saying at the time said, Do not compete with the Drupka, or the Zubdrung, in magical power. During one attempted Tibetan invasion, the hostile Dalai Lama actually wrote a three-page pamphlet detailing to the invading Tibetan soldiers how to perform an exorcism, just in case they had to, because Bhutan was seen to be such a magical place full of dark power waiting to crush the invading Tibetans. But besides the Zubdrung's magical powers, he also played an important role in state building. He worked with local officials to unify the country, and while at first mostly focused on controlling religious power, he began building up a political base as well, setting up regional governors and building what are known as Zongs, which served as administrative centers as well as fortresses. He left rival Buddhist sects and indigenous religious groups alone, so long as they didn't challenge his authority. He also codified laws into the country and encouraged the migration from Tibet into Bhutan. In 1654, Zabdrum Nomgala died, with no real heirs to the new Bhutanese state. He had a son, but he was unable to speak, and his granddaughter died during childbirth. The elites and the governors of the new state all agreed to keep the Zabdrung's death a secret, claiming he was on a retreat, till they could find a suitable replacement. This period of pretending the Zabdrung was still alive lasted until 1708, or 54 years, during which several secular officials took control of the country. The period both during this pretend retreat and after had Bhutan undergo periods of internal unrest, with local lords and officials fighting each other. This would then be followed by periods of peace, followed again by periods of unrest. The real problem was Bhutan didn't have a specific hierarchy that clearly stated who should secede the ruler of the country. Sometimes the incarnations of the Zubdrung held control, sometimes it was a high-ranking official known as the Desi, and other times it was just a regional governor that had managed to hold enough power to effectively rule the country. It would become even more chaotic due to the fact that the Zubdrung had multiple claimants of his reincarnation, with people officially being proclaimed as the reincarnation of his speech, or the reincarnation of his mind, or his body. All these really prevented Bhutan from long periods of peace, as various elites fought for control of the country, each basing their argument for controlling Bhutan simply over who could muster the most support for their claim. The stability of the country also wasn't helped by continued Tibetan invasions and earthquakes. However, Bhutan did manage to hold on and beat back these invasions. It had even managed to expand out to its modern-day borders and into some parts of India, holding what are today parts of Assam, Sikkim, and West Bengal. It grew to play an increasingly dominant role in Sikkimese politics, and by the mid-1700s, it had effectively turned a small Indian state south of it, Kuch Bihar, into a kind of client state. In 1772, a dissident faction of nobles from Kuch Bihar 
asked the British, who were in the process of colonializing much of South Asia, for help in driving the Bhutanese out. The British, wanting to control their northern frontier, which was plagued with banditry, agreed, and after two years of fighting, drove the Bhutanese out of Kuch Bihar, and forced the Bhutanese back. Following this war, Bhutan would begin to expand its relationship with the British, who would play an important role in shaping Bhutanese history. At first, this relationship would extend to just both sides agreeing to try and crack down on banditry and limited trade between the two. However, as the years went by, it became increasingly more apparent that the border between the two wasn't suitable to the British. Banditry still continued, and Bhutan's remaining low-lying territories looked particularly useful for farming. Tension, cross-border raids, and a British diplomatic mission that felt insulted when it arrived in the country led to war in 1864. The war, known as the Dar War, saw British troops invade Bhutanese land twice. The first invasion resulted in a failure, and the second invasion was only mildly successful. However, they had managed to convince the Bhutanese that they were in a much better position strategically, and Bhutan went to the negotiating table where they gave up around 20% of their land. Bhutan did, however, gain a small subsidiary from the British government in India, which would provide an important source of revenue for the poor country, and they didn't have to give away their sovereignty in the peace treaty. By this time, Bhutanese internal politics largely centered around regionalism and familial ties. There was some debate on if the country should engage in a pro-Tibetan or pro-British foreign policy, but largely the main conflicts would be simply over which part of the country held the most power. Bhutan was fairly weak at this time, and it seemed increasingly likely that at some point, it would find itself absorbed into either Tibet or Britain. But in the late 19th century, a new important figure would emerge on the political stage. Yugen Wangchuk was born the son of a local lord in northern Bhutan. He would help his father achieve dominance in Bhutan, and after his father's death in 1881, he would end up taking control. He managed to beat his rivals on the field of battle, or talk them out of revolting, and strengthen the power of the Bhutanese state. He was also a devout Buddhist, renovating temples throughout the country and built Buddhist schools throughout much of the country, offering a religious education to many. In 1907, Wang Chuk declared himself king, formalizing a constitutional transfer of power from one king to the next, and elevated Bhutan status in South Asia. I do want to talk a bit about the kings of Bhutan. The kings are called Dru Giablo, or in English, Dragon King. That is definitely the coolest name of any political official in the world today, and is really just such a hard flex. The Dru Giablo are the ultimate authority in Bhutan, with very limited restrictions on their power. They are, for the most part, able to easily move the country in any direction they so choose. So each king, even today, plays an incredibly important role in the country's politics. Wang Chuk would move Bhutan in a decidedly pro-British direction, but Bhutan also found itself in a kind of complicated relationship with the British government of India. On one hand, Bhutan was its own kingdom, had never formally signed away its sovereignty, and didn't want to be integrated with the rest of British India. However, when Bhutanese diplomats traveled to India, they were treated as minor Indian princes under British rule, which is something that Wang Chuk and his successors actively encouraged along with trying to avoid negotiations with foreign powers without the British, and that subsidy Bhutan got kind of implied that there was some sort of subordinate status between Bhutan and Britain. Bhutan accepted this subordinate status largely so funds could be brought into the small poor kingdom, and to prevent the Tibetans and Chinese from attempting to take it, believing that if they were sided with the British, the Tibetans and Chinese would be dissuaded from attempting to take the small kingdom. Also, we should talk about the new arrivals moving into the south of the country. Starting in the 1910s, an increasingly large number of Nepalis, along with smaller numbers of Indians, began moving into Bhutan. They had moved into the country aided by the British, who, on paper, wanted to simply help the Bhutanese clear forest in the south of the country to be used as farmland. However, the British also hoped that by bringing in such a large number of migrants, they could try and build up a force in the country that would counteract attempts by the Tibetans to hold influence over Bhutan. They believed the mostly Hindu migrants would oppose a merger with the Buddhist Tibetans, and thus back closer ties with British India. The new migrants would grow in number, and by the 90s, around 10 to 30 percent of Bhutan's population would be ethnic Loshampas. After Yugen died in 1926, he would be succeeded by his son, Jigmi Wangchuk. Jigmi would start to modernize the country and build up infrastructure and trade links between it and British India. He helped perform the tax and justice system in the country removing some of the more medieval laws and rules in the country. As a fun fact, it wouldn't be until the 1950s when slavery was fully outlawed in the country. Bhutan was, and still is in many ways, 
shaped by the customs, rules, and infrastructure of the past. Generally, most of the population is rural, living off traditional forms of living and practicing traditional Buddhist beliefs. While there today is a growing number of people moving into urban areas, reaching out to the wider world, and living in a modern lifestyle, Bhutan still is often isolated in its foreign policy, and many in the country oppose attempts to modernize it for fear of losing their unique Bhutanese culture. Bhutan would face some serious challenges in the mid-20th century. Tension between the monarchy and the traditional Zubdrungs would reach a boiling point, with the Zubdrung reaching out to Indian nationalists to try and overthrow the king of Bhutan. This would reach the king's ears, and the Zubdrung and his successors would mysteriously begin to disappear or go missing, with the remaining Zubdrungs being forced into exile or hiding. Bhutan would also face protests from its Nepali population in 1946 over working conditions. Finally, the independence of India would pose a threat to Bhutan. The Wangchuks feared that an independent India would mean Bhutan being absorbed and being forced under Hindu rule. However, after talks with Indian nationalists and declarations of sovereignty, Bhutan welcomed India with open arms when it became independent in 1947, and the two have had mostly positive relations ever since. Bhutan will grow even closer to India after the Chinese invasion of Tibet. This invasion brought both Tibetan refugees into the country and made Bhutanese officials afraid of a Chinese annexation. Today, the border between Bhutan and China is still disputed, with Bhutan relying on the Indian military, who is allowed to move and pass through the country, to halt Chinese influence in Bhutan. One example of the tension between Bhutan and China appeared in 2017, when Indian and Chinese troops fought in the disputed area over a road China was attempting to build. Also, fun fact, most of the conflicts that you see in these disputed areas between China and India are actually not fought with guns or nukes, but usually with like sticks, clubs, and primitive shields, largely to prevent an all-out war between China and India breaking out and World War III and the end of the world starting. In 1953, a parliament for the country was established, with a national council being formed to represent officials throughout the country. This would signify the first step towards democracy, although it would be a while before elections were actually held. In the early 2000s, the fourth king, Jigming Singya, would help put limits on the king's power and allow for the National Assembly to force abdication, although this would be extremely difficult and has never happened. Many in Bhutan surprisingly opposed the move to democracy, fearing political strife and mismanagement. However, the king's push for it, and Bhutan's first election was held in 2008, with elections also happening in 2013 and 2018. The main legal parties of Bhutan are all fairly moderate and supportive of the monarchy. In 2008, conservatives won, and then liberals in 2013, until moderate social democrats took charge in 2018. But not all of Bhutan supported moderate politics and gradual reform. In the south, many Nepali migrants began to grow angry over the lack of funds and support for their community. Many joined clandestine groups protesting for a greater say for their community and more employment opportunities for their people. This set off alarm bells for many Bhutanese officials. In 1975, the Kingdom of Sikkim, a small isolated Buddhist kingdom similar to Bhutan, was overthrown by Nepali migrants and the Indian army, who demanded democracy and freedom to the growing Nepalese population in the state. Sikkim then joined India, and the traditional Buddhist rulers lost much of their power. They feared a similar event taking place in Bhutan, and began to institute the One Nation, One People policy. This effectively forced Nagalup culture and traditions over the entire country to try and unite it and crush dissent. These policies included stuff like having a mandated dress code for entering public buildings, attempting to prevent Nepali from being spoken in public, and suppressing hostile political groups. These policies are still in effect today. This reached a boiling point in the late 80s. A limited rebellion began with Nepalis taking some villages and towns in southern Bhutan, with many more Nepalis participating in protests against the One Nation, One People policy. The Bhutanese army cracked down on the Nepalis, and began a process of killings, forced disappearances, and mass deportations. From not just those who opposed them, but really any Nepalis they found. It is believed somewhere between 30,000 to over 100,000 or, in other words, around one-sixth of Bhutan's entire population at the time, was forced to flee the country, with most of those who fled being stripped of their citizenship. While some of these refugees have managed to return home, many still today exist in refugee camps in Nepal or northern India. The Indian and Nepali government have largely ignored them, with many being left stateless. Others have chosen to move abroad, with communities of these refugees being found in countries like Canada, Australia, and the United States with a particularly large community found in Seattle, Washington. Now one of the things you may have heard about Bhutan coming into this episode is its policy of measuring what it calls gross national happiness, or GNH. 
The idea is measuring a country's worth not based on economic growth or how much money a country makes, but rather how happy the people in the country are. This means making a government that is focused on ensuring the culture and particularly the environment of the country is protected and secured. Probably one of the reasons so much of Bhutan is still forested and kept in its natural environment is because this policy seeks to put the interest of people first. GNH recordings tend to show around 80% of the country is currently happy with how Bhutan is being governed. GNH also is one of the reasons the tourism sector is so limited and exclusive. While Bhutan has been expanding its tourism sector, it has also deliberately tried to prevent Bhutan from coming out like other major tourist destinations around the world. Cough cough, Rome, with hordes of tourists swarming the countryside, littering all over the place, and reducing Bhutan to a novel and exotic place. It wants to keep tourism limited among a select few tourists so that they can better keep Bhutan as its own unique place with a living culture. GNH finally has also improved Bhutan's image in the world, with there being plenty of articles and videos talking about the wonder of GNH and therefore the wonder of Bhutan and its government. I think many can agree that GNH is a very beautiful idea, with many people wishing that governments and people just took happiness more seriously, but it still attracts critics. Perhaps most obviously, it's easy to get a lot of the country to like the way things are going after you remove thousands of them that were protesting. The remaining people may be happy, but their happiness only exists because Bhutan cleansed its southern border of undesirables and those that didn't conform. There also has been complaints that GNH has been used by elites in the country as a kind of smokescreen to distract from real complaints in the country, like high poverty, lack of upward mobility, political power being concentrated in the hands of a few, and high rates of domestic abuse. Before I talk about the current leaders of the country, I want to talk about three internal threats to political stability in Bhutan. The first is from the Zabdrung, yes he still exists, and his followers. However, I would be very shocked if they managed to get enough support to seriously threaten the government. Many in the country like the king and the monarchy, and are fearful of the instability theocratic Bhutan suffered under. The next threat is from illegal and underground parties, who mostly operate among the Nepali community in exile, and tend to be leftist in their outlook. They similarly don't really have a wide range of support, but if they could connect with people on economic issues, they could be problematic for the Bhutanese government. Finally, the last threat is from Indian separatists. Militant separatists in the state of Assam will often set up base in Bhutan and use it as a base of operations to raid the Indian military and sometimes into Bhutan. In 2003, the Bhutanese military removed most of these militants, but cross-border raids still do happen. The current king is Jigmi Khazar Namgo Wangchuk, the fifth king of the country, and has ruled the country since 2006 when his father stepped down. He sought to increase democratization of the country and improve conditions for people, particularly in the countryside. He has been widely liked by many Bhutan, and much like GNH, you can find a lot of praise for him in western papers, talking about how down to earth he is apparently. The current prime minister of the country is Lote Tirshing. Tirshing has been prime minister since 2018, as a part of the center-left Bhutan United Party. So why does Bhutan exist? Bhutan exists because it has found itself sandwiched between two large players. It has sought to be a blend of its northern and southern neighbors, but still stood fiercely independent, wanting to protect itself no matter the cost. The mentality of putting national unity above anything else, and refusing to let Bhutan integrate with the outside world, is what has kept Bhutan alive through thick and thin. Up next, we go west to Bolivia, prepare for the Spanish, a landlocked country that keeps losing land, the CIA, and a peach drink. Take care, I hope you enjoyed. I would again like to thank Professor Bhattacharya from Western Washington University for helping me out and giving me the oral history presentation to look at. It was very helpful, so thank you. Up next, I'm going to do an episode on Canadian parties, and then I have British parties, and I'll do uh, the history of Bolivia. I have a whole bunch of other like requests lined up. Uh, thank you to everyone that is requesting stuff, I appreciate it. I know it kind of takes me a while to get to everyone's requests, but I appreciate them nonetheless. If you want to send me a request for an episode or whatever, uh, you can either comment it in the comments below if you're on YouTube, or you can send me an email at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this episode are DW's documentary on Bhutan, Fact Fiend's video, The Lady Killing Dragon King of Bhutan, Geography Now's video on Bhutan, GVI's article, Why Bhutan is the Only Carbon Negative Country in the World, Krema Pushoto's book, The History of Bhutan, which was very, very helpful in writing this episode, Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History on Bhutan, MSN News article, 
Bhutan's king tracked to stop COVID, but he's walking between India and China. NDTV's video, Bhutanese Elections, What Do Young Voters Think? An oral history interview with Yug Dubaidi. Prof G's video, Variations on Buddhism. Rajiv's Malhotra's video, Bhutan's Ethnic Cleansing of Hindus. Real Royalties documentary, The Magnificent History of Bhutan's Royal Family. Tirshing Tolge's TED Talk, The Country Isn't Just Carbon Neutral, It's Carbon Negative and Wikipedia.